branch of service were you in? I was in the Army, and I served in Vietnam. What was your rank? Uh, spec 5, Specialist 5th Class. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted in May of 1964. Where were you living at that time? 66 Pioneer Drive, West Hartford, Connecticut. Why did you enlist? I had just finished two years of junior college, up at Dean Junior College, it's now a full year, four year college, at uh, Franklin, Massachusetts. And it was just, I was uh, 20, 20 years old, just turned 20. And at that point in time, in 1964, we all had a military obligation to fulfill. And I thought, you know, I'll get it out of the way. Let me, uh, I was certainly going to have to do my time in the service at some point in my life. You know, it was inescapable. You had the, the draft or you enlisted. And by being, uh, by enlisting, you had options that weren't available to a draftee and there wasn't much difference to me at 20 years old between two years and three years. Whereas the Army I chose because the Navy, Marines, or Air Force required a four-year enlistment. <laughs> <coughs> so there was a difference between two and four years. So by enlisting in the Army, you were committed for two years? Three. three. By enlisting, I was committed for three. Also, when you enlisted for three years, when you got out, that ended your obligation. You were then three years on in You had a six-year military obligation. We all did. And as a, a regular Army enlistee, your second three years were spent on inactive reserve, whereas a draftee, after serving two years on active duty, would then spend his next four years going to monthly meetings and two-week summer camps. So they did tie you up for six, the full six years as a draftee, whereas as an enlistee, three and you were essentially done. Yeah. Do you recall your first days in service? Oh, yes, vividly. Can you tell me what that was like? My first days, well, of course, you. We went down to New Haven and then got bused to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And a whole group of young and eager kids at that point in time. There was no Vietnam yet. And, and the patriotism was uh, at a fever pitch uh, in, in, that, in that era. You had the, uh, there, there was no protesting against the government. You had the civil rights movement that was uh, pretty well in full swing. But we'd, uh, we'd of course had the success of World War II and we'd uh, triumphed essentially in Korea. So the, the military was on a roll and there weren't any conflicts going on at the time. We had advisors in Vietnam, but uh, most, most Americans couldn't have, uh, didn't know where Vietnam was. They couldn't have told you what, what ocean it was surrounded it. So, so. And uh, anyways, my first days, uh, the usual, you get there and you get all these things thrown at you, all the equipment and gear you're going to need and uh, hustle here and there and the, all the long-haired kids, uh, suddenly everyone looks alike with their hair shorn off and uh, it was, uh, uh, I had, had the uh, benefit of, if you call it that, my first semester out of uh, high school. I, w I went to Norwich University, which is a military academy in Northfield, Vermont, and uh, didn't like it, but that's why I transferred to the junior college. But I did, I did get a, the initial military training, all, all the uh, left and right face and about face and the marching, that sort of thing. I, I had done that, so it wasn't all new to me. It wasn't as if I was a soldier or anything, but just, just the little things. You, you felt like you maybe you had a, a leg up. And, uh, but, and how well do you remember? The uh, buck sergeant, which is three stripes, explained that those three stripes meant barbed wire city. And the sergeant first class, which is two rockers and three stripes, explained that his meant I will jail your ass. So those Polaroid snapshots are forever indelible in your mind. Where did you do your boot camp? Was that at Fort Dix? That was at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And it's interesting to note that the, the you always have in any, in any basic training uh, 
area. You have week after week after week, there's always someone starting, and then it was an eight, eight week, and I imagine still is eight weeks of, uh, of boot camp. And uh, actually called it basic training. The Marines are the ones that call it boot camp. In the Army, it's always referred to as basic training. And with companies, and it's, I was an I company, and so there's a, there's a class a week ahead of you, there's a class a week behind you, and subsequently, you know, two, three, four weeks. Apparently, our class was an experiment. Some, some sort of, this was some psychological control exercise for the Army. And I was very fortunate in that when you had to go five miles out to the firing range, we rode in trucks. The other companies walked, hiked. Yeah, I were doing it, conducting and seeing how, what the difference would be at the end of the eight weeks. If, Did you know you were an experiment? Uh, we, we figured it out by about the sixth week. But they didn't tell you? No one told us, no. But when we were riding and driving past platoons and companies that were marching the five miles to the parade, or to the firing range, you sort of, yeah. You knew you were different. Yeah, it's, it, by, the, by the sixth week or so, it was, you know, th there was a rumor filtering around and, and it made sense. Yeah, why, why were we the only ones? Yeah, so, uh, luck of the draw, yeah. Do you remember your instructors during basic training? I remember the sergeant, the first sergeant. Can't remember their names, but. Uh, what were they like? Uh, they were obviously career soldiers. Uh, they they had a bunch of raw, yeah, young kids, you know, un, untrained, unsophisticated, and they had to mold them into shape in eight weeks, and certainly they were graded by their superiors and how good a job they did. So very businesslike, went about their job, their, their days were planned down to the second meticulous detail. And it, uh, the training isn't difficult, but uh, you, there's never a minute's, uh, you know, it, every, everything is planned. And, but they, they were very good and, and concerned. They didn't, uh, didn't pick on anybody. Uh, might have uh, worked the kid that needed to lose some weight a little harder, but uh, not in a derisive way. Yeah. And you were at Fort Dix for eight weeks? The Fort Dix for eight weeks, and, and then in the, in the Army you go to what they call Advanced Individual Training, AIT. Now since the majority of people go to infantry training, AIT is often called advanced infantry training, but the actual designation is advanced individual. And by virtue of the battery of tests that I had taken on enlistment, uh, fresh out of college, I did well in the math and science. I indicated that I'd want to go to OCS, and so they sent me to artillery school down in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And how long were you there? And that's another eight weeks. That's your second eight weeks. They give you a two-week leave after basic. And a lot of that is to get your two weeks paid leave out of the way. You know, it's, it's almost, a, you don't have a choice. After basic, you get two weeks leave, and then you report to your next duty station. Now you're theirs for the next 40 weeks before you have any leave time. And so it's well thought out. And of course, everybody's glad to go home after two, week, after two weeks after basic training. Yeah. What was uh, Fort Sill like in your training there? I got to Fort Sill in August. And Fort Sill, the town there is Lawton. It's about 100 miles from Oklahoma City. And there wasn't anything taller than three feet between Fort, uh, Fort Sill and Oklahoma City. I always said that Oklahoma was miles and miles of miles and miles of miles and miles. Very flat, very hot. 110 in the shade, and I, uh, how much anecdotal information do you want about Fort Sill? Anything Go you for it. Remember. Oh, I remember it vividly. Uh, the artillery training, you had the first three weeks basically were spent in the classroom, and then you went out to the field, to the firing ranges. Now, 
We went out a couple times in those first three weeks, and then from the fourth week to the seventh week, it was literally every day. I happened to notice during the first three weeks, the couple of times that we went out there, that in the morning, <coughs> you would form up in the company area by platoons, by some squad, platoon, company, and there would be a few instructions, mail would be passed out, and then if we were going out to the field, it would be a tent hut, right face, forward march, and you would march around to an area where there were trucks to which the uh, 105 millimeter howitzers were attached. And when you got over to the staging area, everybody piled in the trucks. Went out to the field, uh, and it was basically 12 guys to a truck. So if you ran up to a truck, and there was room, you got in. If there were already 12, whoops, go to the next one. And there were enough trucks so that everybody was gonna get a seat. Well, when we get out to the field, uh, you stayed with your truck and your howitzer. You never went back to your squad or your uh, platoon until you returned back to the company area, got off the trucks, then everybody formed up again as a company in platoons and squads and cleaned the howitzers because they got all dusty going back and forth. And by then it was time for dinner. They get back at 3.15 on the dot, right, very punctual. Well, starting on the fourth week, and I say it was tremendously hot out there, there were bleachers in the, out in the sun, and you sat and listened to an instructor and then watched some test firings, the howitzers. At lunchtime, we managed to find some shade and a little, little wooded grove. Starting on the fourth week, it was every day out there. Now, I, the fourth sill was an old World War II base, and the barracks didn't have plumbing. There were outside latrines, which had a washroom, toilets, showers, everything. Hey. I happened to be in the fourth squad of my platoon. One, two, three, four. And I happened to stand almost directly in front of the latrine door. And I had this wild hunch. I knew that no one knew who was out in the field. So after mail call, I had been standing at parade rest, and I simply ducked, took two steps back, one step to the right, and I was in the latrine. I then went over and sat down so that if I was questioned, I had a good excuse. I mean, there was no doubt about it. I had to be here. And I listened to the company commanders say, ten shut, right face, and forward march. And they all marched away. I then climbed out of the bathroom window into the next company area. It was now a little before 8 o'clock in the morning. This was the tough part. I had to kill until 9 o'clock when the library opened. The library was air conditioned. And at 11 o'clock, the enlisted men's club opened and I could go get lunch. At 3.15, about 5 after 3, I was behind a tree waiting for those trucks to roll in. When those trucks rolled in, I ran over and joined this melee. Right? And so long as I was there to clean a howitzer, I was never missed. And I did that for four weeks. You did it every day? I did it every day, yes. And the librarian must have wondered what this buck private was doing there every morning at 9 o'clock waiting for her to open. Nobody told on you? Uh, I didn't, I didn't know any, you know, you get close to some people, but I never get close to anybody there. I was only there for three weeks. The guy weeks. next to you didn't figure uh, out what you were they, doing? If they figured out, they didn't care. You were pretty bold, man. You're pretty they, yeah. they didn't care. You know, if anybody said, you know, I <laughs> could have said, well, gee, you know, I, I missed the truck, man. I didn't know what to do. That would always have been my standard excuse, you know, that, gosh, I had to go to the latrine, and by the time I was ready to go, I went, to, I ran over to the truck staging area, and they were gone. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Well, didn't you miss out on a lot of good artillery training? I missed out on a lot of time spent in 110 degrees in the, <laughs> in the shade. That's what I missed. And, Why uh, did you select the artillery? I, well, it was, selected, it was selected for me. And I was then, would have gone to uh, OCS as a, an artillery officer. And they, they trained both artillery and infantry officers. Now, when I enlisted, I chose airborne. No. No, I essentially enlisted airborne unassigned. I was going to be a soldier. 
Yeah, might as well do it right. Well, from Fort Sill, I went to Fort Benning. And that's uh, where they have their jump school. That lasts three weeks. And the first week is ground week, second week is tower week, the third week is jump week. And there you, you really, really, uh, it's, it's physically demanding. And 1,200 started, 500 finished. They're, they want to, uh, well, I'd, weakling, not as a derogatory term, but uh, you, you want to you wanna get rid of the, the slackers, basically, because it, it, it's, it's demanding. And you've got to have people that really want to do it. And they almost, they do, in fact, encourage people to quit. And it rained for the first two weeks. And you do a lot of push-ups in jump school. You, it's called pushing Georgia away. And doing push-ups in the mud isn't a lot of fun. And when you're told to do 10, you count out loud. When you get to 9, you always have to start over. So you wind up doing 50. Yeah, that's just the way it is. And the sergeants are continually, hey, if you want to quit, just walk over there. You go up to that platoon. I got hot food waiting for you. Yeah. And many took advantage of that opportunity. Because I don't see how they could have lived it down. From the, you know. But anyways, uh, made it through those first two weeks. And the interesting thing there was that the first week, Monday to Friday, was demanding enough. You ran everywhere you went in jump school. From the time you got up until the time you got back to the barracks at night, you ran. You ran to Chow. You ran down to the, the training area. Anywhere you had to go, you double times. And on Saturday, no training on Saturday and Sunday, but Saturday morning was GI the barracks for an inspection. You did have Sunday off. Well, in the middle of the second week, it was announced that on Wednesday, there would be a representative from Special Forces there after, uh, in, in the evening. Okay. Well, as a break in the routine, I thought, okay, let's go, go to the meeting. Yeah. Well, this guy gave a pep talk about Special Forces and announced that they would be giving a test on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. Well, what, what happens if you go to that test? You don't have to stay there in GI the barracks. I was all over that test. <laughs> now, I spent from 8 to noon in an auditorium taking, a, taking tests while all the other guys were cleaning the barracks. And they were interesting tests in that this wasn't any intelligence test. A lot of this was psychology. You would watch a film and they'd shut the film off abruptly and you know, how many cars you know, are give you a, what would you do in this situation? You know, you're told to uh, run up a hill. Uh, all you have is a pen knife. And there are six machine gun nests at the top of the hill. And your sergeant says, go take those machine gun nests. What do you do? Well, <laughs> <laughs> in today's, in this day and age, you'd ask if you could make a couple phone calls first but through the cell phone. But I, back then, I don't think you had that option. <laughs> Anyways, uh, obviously, it would seem they didn't want the answer to they didn't want you to answer. I'd turn around and tell the sergeant to do it himself. <laughs> that would probably would have been the bit wrong answer. Yeah. So anyway, it was interesting, and uh, I had no idea. I never heard as to whether I had uh, passed the test. And I thought I'd get notified. And come uh, the end of you did a you jumped once on Monday, once on Tuesday, twice on Wednesday, once Thursday morning, and then Thursday afternoon you had the graduation ceremony. And after the graduation ceremony, you then went to a huge bulletin board for you know, 400 names on it to see where you were going to be assigned. And finally got up there to the front of the queue and saw my name, and I was assigned to Special Forces Training Group at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So I said, oh, gee, I guess I passed the test, huh? Uh, and that was a very interesting experience in that it was a 10-hour bus ride, as I recall. And how long had you been at Fort Benning before you went to Just Fort three Fort weeks. Just three weeks. We jump. Right you go to jump school for three weeks, you start, you finish, you're gone. Yeah. Yeah, and that's all it is is training. I mean some people might then stay on at Fort Benning or something. And once you've finished airborne, you go to most people will go to the eighty second, which is at Fort Bragg. 
101st, which is at Fort Campbell. Uh, and also at uh, Fort Bragg is Special Forces and the JFK Centers for Special Warfare. Those seem to be the four play, but most everybody went to the 82nd and 101st. Uh, there was another airborne outfit in, in Guam or the Philippines, something like that, but uh, I don't know if they sent people fresh from, from jump school to there. You might have gone to another outfit and got transferred. So you went to the 82nd? No, I went to Special Forces, oh, the Special different. Forces Training Group. Yeah, they're both at Fort Bragg, but they're entirely separate. Yeah. And the, the bus dropped people off, dropped all the guys off at the 82nd, then went over to the JFK Center of Special Warfare, dropped off three or four guys there, and then there were, I think, 10 of us for Special Forces. We pulled up at 10 o'clock at night. Now, I've been in the service just, you know, May, June, July, September, October, uh, five months. So you know, I've gone from uh, E1 to E2, and my still a private. The next jump is the first private first class. And my pay, concomitantly, had gone from $78 a month to $83 a month. <laughs> Different world back then. Yeah. Well. We get there at 10 o'clock at night, and now we've all got our duffel bags and all our gear. Get off the, the bus in front of the uh, orderly room, we call it, be your little company headquarters. And the sergeant comes out, and he says, all right, leave your stuff there. He says, and follow me. Well, when you get to a new outfit, you've got to go in over to a uh, quartermaster area and get the mattress and the blanket and the pillow and you know you're a you're a pack horse by the time you get get to your room so he said follow me and we followed this guy and he said wait here and he went in, in this barracks and he came down with a sleepy guy uh, and we went up to the mess hall the guy unlocked the mess hall went in and he said well, what would you guys like to eat uh really <laughs> but steak and eggs, yeah, no problem, we had steak and eggs. And then we left and went back down and for some, of course now we gotta go back down and get our duffel bags and get all our gear. And he brought us down to a barracks and said, okay, you guys are upstairs. And you'll find your, your bunk up there. One upstairs, our duffel bags were there at the foot of a bed that was made. And I went, you gotta be kidding me. You know, it's more like the Hilton. <laughs> so, uh, but they treated you uh, sort of special at the Special Forces Training uh, Group because uh, it was an elite outfit. That's the one that Kennedy started. You weren't an officer yet. No, I'm just, I'm still a private, yeah. And this actually put the OCS, uh, uh, forestalled that, this took precedence as far as the Army was concerned. Had I not gone to that Special Forces meeting taking that test, then I would have gone from jump school to OCS. Right. But when I took that test, the Army figured we'd much rather have him in, in Special Forces than you know, OCS, so, uh, as I deduce later. And Special Forces was uh, a lot of fun and, and interesting. Uh, there were, uh, you were given a ch two choices in terms of your military occupational specialty, MOS, your job. And they needed commo and medics. And I like math and science, as I said. So I was all over the medics, uh, yeah, and I didn't want to be lugging around a radio anyways. I could just imagine trying to learn Morse code. And so I went through the training there, and towards the end of the training, and that was, you went down to Fort uh, Sam Houston, Texas, spent 20 weeks down there. Eight weeks was whatever your medic in the service got. That was the basic course, how to put on a Band-Aid, how to put on a battle dressing. Okay. Then we had another 12 weeks. And I'd say it was akin to college courses. It was uh, uh, eight, day, eight hours of classroom and a four-hour test every Monday. And uh, the attrition rate was high. And then we, from there we went to Fort Campbell. I did. We went to different hospitals in the Third Army area for nine weeks of on-the-job training in which you rotated through different areas of the hospital, clinics, emergency room, ear, nose, and throat, uh, obstetrics, uh, you know, recovery room, uh, orthopedics. You know. And uh, I got to do everything from uh, dentistry. I got to do everything from uh, learn how to, how to pull uh, wisdom teeth to uh, system of deliveries. So, you know, 
And these were all things that we had to know because we, we were trained to be out in the field with no medical facility nearby. And you basically had to attend to a patient and keep them alive maybe for a week until you, you can get medical, uh, you know, in a, in a hospital so, or who knows how long. So a lot of things that we were entrusted to do and learned how to do that the average Army medic would not have any knowledge of, nor, nor would he ever have any use to do these things because there was some other skilled medical professional to do it. And then went back to Fort Bragg, I had a dog lab. And at this, by this point in time, I had uh, I'd gotten married, of all things, one of those things you do when you're young and dumb. And uh, with Vietnam, uh, now becoming somewhat of a, a focus. Well, not yet, not really. It's the, now it's the end of 65. Okay. So I asked for a transfer to the Fort Womack uh, Army Hospital there at Fort Bragg. Okay. And I got it. And I went over there and, uh, and became a lab technician. But now they started to look for guys into Vietnam and boom, because my primary MOS was a medic, I got my orders, to, my marching orders for February of 66 to go to Vietnam. And February 21st, I got a month's leave and then flew out to San Francisco. And back then you flew military standby, half price. Uh, but of course you weren't guaranteed getting a seat. So I went to the airport a day early. And if that way, if I got on, I had a day to spend in San Francisco, but to go there that day and not be able to get on and have to pay full, fa full fare, okay. So, so I got up to San Francisco, I had a day to kill. And uh, interesting, I rented a car and went up and down all those hills. Yeah, fabulous place. I wound up later living in California and in LA and wind up and was back in Frisco a number of times. Anyways, uh, the small world story of all time for me occurred when I'm ready to leave for Vietnam. Oakland Army Terminal is where you depart from. Uh, that's that's uh, Oakland next to San Francisco. You got there across the bay from each other. And so that were where I was where I was to report. Let's say I got to San Francisco on a Tuesday and Wednesday, I had a report there. So I duly report there at 10 o'clock in the morning and do all the processing. And the plane's gonna leave at three o'clock in the afternoon. So at two o'clock in the afternoon, I picked up the phone to call my folks and say goodbye. Well, I typically dialed 0203, the area code for Connecticut, and the 2325900 for my folks. 232 back then, would 203 would designate Connecticut and 232 would designate West Hartford. Yeah. And uh, the operator answered and I said, hi, this is Collect from Sam. And whereupon the voice said, is this Sam Thieker? And I went, uh, who's this? She said, Angel, Angel Fusco, remember me? We graduated together. What are the odds that she, five years later, would wind up there, have that job, be on duty at that time, and field my call? But she, but I figured later that here she was, uh, probably you could tell where the calls were coming from. I'm certain it was an operation. She saw from, it's coming from the Oakland Army Terminal. Guys are leaving. They're calling to say goodbye. She sees 203. Oh, it's somebody from Connecticut. She sees 232. Oh, it's somebody from West Hartford. And then she hears Sam, and how many Sams are there? And it was, you know, so I didn't know her well, but I, but I knew her and her brothers. And so just like, yeah, so we chatted for a minute, and then she put me through. Wow. <laughs> that was a small yes, yeah, the, the, the odds against that have to be uh, quite high. So then I wound up uh, in, in Vietnam. Now, I never have been a fan of cold weather, even though I grew up in Connecticut. I never skied. I never skated. I never wanted to. So I'm the guy. Must love this winter. <laughs> well, there's a story about why I'm here, but I'm also leaving. I'm going back to California. Uh, so I'm the guy that got off the plane in Saigon. It was 106 degrees, and I said, "Hey, great weather." <laughs> Your plane landed in Saigon. That's where you flew into. Saigon, the airport there is just called Tansanu. From there, I was uh, assigned to. The first division, uh, first of the 26th, which uh, I don't know, is a first 
regiment, 26, whatever, and, uh, and then to a company and all that. Uh, and I was a recon medic because of my extensive training, which meant that I got to go out with just a small group of guys. There'd be like a dozen of us to go out and look around, see what's going on. Yeah, look for trouble. Yeah, or look for somebody looking for trouble, whatever. Well, I had been trained as a lab tech uh, long enough to get my, what they called your secondary MOS. Right. Now, would I have much rather been a lab tech over in Vietnam? Absolutely. But uh, it wasn't up to me. They didn't ask me, what, what would you let rather be? So I, I uh, was out in the field quite a bit. And I guess it's worth mentioning that my, you, you always, I've always had a leprechaun in my pocket. I know it. When I got there, the, within the, they didn't send you out in the field for somewhere in the neighborhood of 7 to 14 days. They wanted you to get acclimated to the climate. When you flew into Tonsonu, is that the base that you were stationed at? No. Stationed? No, from Tonsonu, I, I wound up at Zion, which was spelled D-I-A-N, D-D-I, and then capital A-N, as, as I recall, pronounced Zion. And that was about 40 miles northwest of Saigon. And that was where the, uh, the first division was. Or, or that's, no, you know what? I think, I think I went to a place called Phuc, P-H-U-O-C, VIN, V-I-N-H, first. And that was where the first of the 26 was. Okay, we'll get back to Zion in a minute. So I wind up in the Spook VIN, and uh, that's where my outfit is. And after a couple weeks, then they send you out, and they'll, they'll start sending you out in the field. And you might go out in the field for three days, you might go there for three weeks. Nah, but this was the base camp that you were housed at. Well, my first time, and there were two of us, and they needed one guy to go with Team A and one guy to go with Team B. You, you, Team A, Team B. I came back. The other guy didn't. So, you know, there's a flip of the coin there. That was 50-50. Uh, and a couple other weird things like that, you know. But, uh, there were the only, I do have a couple war stories. Uh, the only ones I tell are my Purple Heart story. No, I didn't get a Purple Heart, but here's the story. We had stopped our poking around for the day and decided to make camp. Now, the roads in Vietnam are built up high because of the monsoon rains. So you have a road that's three feet mound, you know, higher than the terrain. And a couple feet of that, you're washed away during the monsoon. Well, we camped on this side of a road you know, over here and over the hill and through the woods. There was a river. We sent a couple guys out to scout, and they radioed back that they thought they saw something cross. Well, they did see something crossing the river, and it might be VC. So our lieutenant then called in an artillery strike from who knows how many miles away. Uh, they called it H and I harassment and interdiction, and they would lob a half dozen shells into the river. Well, young and green lieutenant that he was, he prone to mistakes, I guess. And unfortunately, instead of giving them the coordinates for the river, he gave them our coordinates. So, so we were, we were sitting there. Uh, you know, it was just there's just ten of us and two guys out out there coming back from uh, there poking around, and we had a jeep, and we're sitting there, and I, I figured, well, you know, if they're coming, uh, might as well. So I fixed the bayonet on the rifle, and I'm sitting there in the edge of the jeep. And all of a sudden, you hear, you know, the, now you hear, you could hear them from miles away, the whoomp, and the whoosh. <laughs> and here they come, and that whistle, and you went, holy cow, that whistle sounds like, and sure enough. So I dove, I hit the ground, and I crawled under the Jeep. Now, remember that road? All six shells hit on the other side of the road so that all the shrapnel up to three feet high buried itself in the road. Therefore, anything over three feet just whistled over everybody's heads because everybody's on the ground. Therefore, nobody was hurt. Nah. Except here comes yours truly, crawling out from under the Jeep once all the dust settled. Nah. And I managed to stab the bayonet in my palm of my hand. Nah. Now I come out and there I am, geez, great, you know. So I'm, 
I'm bandaging my hand, and one of the guys comes over and he says, hey, Doc, wow, you got hit, huh? You get a Purple Heart. And I said, Purple Heart, hell, I stabbed myself with my own bayonet. Well, oh so there's a... That was interesting that it was artillery. Did you know what was going on having had former artillery training? Oh, I, uh, I mean, I, I, knew, I knew right away, giving them the wrong coordinates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when did he figure it out? Uh, right away, too. Oh, uh, yeah, it was stop, stop, hello. <laughs> They'd already stopped. They sent off their six, and that was it. They were waiting for more orders. It turned out to be water buffalo, by the way, that were crossing the uh, river. So, and, uh, and we weren't always very bright over there. And there was another time when uh, another story that I tell is we had been poking around, and uh, we'd been out, in the, out for quite a while. And such that when I took off my jacket, I gingerly placed it a good 10 or 12 feet away from me. Yeah. As when I took it off, then I began to realize just how terrible that was. At any rate, uh, we stopped to make camp for the night, and different lieutenant, but equally bright, decided that we were going to be really clever after making uh, making us opening the tents or sleeping bags and getting things set up this was just before dusk right? after when it got dark we would then pick up and tiptoe about 50 meters away that way if any VC had been watching us you know, and they were gonna move in on us when they were asleep aha would we fool them well we also happened to be somewhere near the perimeter of a base camp and he neglected to mention to them that we were there and that we would be moving. So that when we started moving after dark, they picked us up on radar and opened up with 50 caliber machine guns until we could get a hold of them and say, hi, we're on your side. And uh, the one thing I remember about that is, is <laughs> stuff whistling through the trees. <laughs> and, I, and I am trying to figure out how a rabbit does it and actually burrows himself under the ground and I'm laying there and I'm thin, you know, just nothing but machine gun bullets going a couple feet above the ground and I'm thinking, oh man, don't anybody say medic. Because <laughs> then I got to get up. <laughs> you hear medic, I'm gone. You know, it's not like you can sit there and think about it, but nobody, nobody said medic, so I, w I was very happy for that. Yes. And... Uh, yeah, those couple of stories like that, that uh, I say, those are the ones I tell to have a little humor to them and, and no one got hurt. Yes. When you, do you remember the date you arrived in country? Yeah, February, uh, left February 21st, so if you pick up a day crossing the date line, then I guess it's 22nd. Which, which way do you pick up a day and which way do you, let's see, it keeps getting earlier until it becomes the day before. So actually I left on the 21st and arrived on the 21st. And then when you come back, you, you jump a day. Were there many casualties in your unit? In one, uh, in one particular operation, uh, we sustained heavy casualties. We had uh, virtually an entire company wiped out. Entire platoon, excuse me, not company. How big was the platoon? 40 guys. So you didn't always go out with small group groups as a recon medic? There was one time when the, when the whole outfit went out and uh, I, was, I was with a platoon that time. And uh, actually a squad, I think. But uh, we were, it was the whole, the whole bit was there. So, the, uh, so our reconnaissance unit was what we were called. Uh, we were with everybody else. Instead of the reconnaissance unit going out on their own, you had your couple of recon units there out with the, just everybody went in this major operation and uh, it turned out to be something, yeah. The jungle that we know from Tarzan movies as, as kids, and that's what we star generation did, uh, you're totally unprepared for what jungle is really like. Uh, there are, of course, the there's areas where the canopy is just so so high and virtually no light penetrates and you're you know in, in a twilight zone underneath and there's not a lot of ground vegetation because there, there's no sunlight uh, and then where there's not tall trees the low-lying vegetation 
is so thick and impenetrable that when you say machetes, I mean, yeah, you'd need, you would need a machete to get from me to you and it would take five minutes. That's just, you know, absolutely, <laughs> you know, it's all over, growing in and among itself and these vines and shrubs and everything. Yeah, of course, things grow well in the tropics. With the, and yeah. was this geographically where were you located in Vietnam? Not up by Da Nang, was it more? No, I'm, I'm down in the south. I'm, I'm okay. in the... In the, in the southern part, yeah. Da Nang was, a lot of Marines up there, and the, and the 82nd was up there. Uh, yeah, the south was uh, 1st Division. Uh, the, there's a cavalry division. I forget exactly the number of them, the 100 and something armored cavalry that were the horse soldiers back in the 1800s, and now they were mechanized. Now, that, was, uh, that was them. Let me get your water here. Uh, the... That business with the terrain being so impassable, it was one. You don't mind these tales, huh? This is what you're after. Uh, there was one instance where, and this was with the whole company, where we followed behind tanks and half tracks. They knocked down this vegetation so that we could then go through it. And when I say they knocked it down, actually they matted it down, but when they then moved forward, it came back up to about mid-thigh level. Right. So when we followed them, we were walking as if you're walking in water up to your thigh. Right. What would you have to do? You couldn't go straight forward. You'd have to keep lifting your leg up out of the water and putting it down again. Well, that's what we had to do only it was vegetation. So it wasn't probably a little easier in the water. Also, when you knock down all that vegetation, everybody that lived there got really upset because you just messed up their home. Everybody meaning all the ants and little critters. Now it's very hot, of course, which you're used to, but because of all these little critters having lost their home and out to seek vengeance, we had our shirts buttoned up tight at the wrist, right, buttoned all the way up to the neck. Right, and it's real hot. So the only thing exposed is your hands and your face. So I didn't have glasses then. But I do remember walking along, lifting each foot like that, and you're constantly going. And you did that for, you know. But <laughs> you developed a rhythm after a while. <laughs> I think we might have got some little jug band going there if we tried hard enough. So. Uh, you know, those little experiences that you will uh, never be duplicated. But, uh, yeah. God. <laughs> but uh, yeah, interesting to have, to have gone through it. Then. But it was on that particular operation that uh, the unit incurred a lot of casualties. Yeah. Were you a prisoner of war at all? Thankfully, no. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Yes, I oh, guess. Purple Heart, we know that. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll hold that one. Interestingly enough, as I say, I've told that story a number of times, and, and one fellow actually told me in all seriousness, he says, you know, you could have gotten a Purple Heart for that. And I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I would have been proud of that. <laughs> Were you awarded any other medals? Uh, yes, in addition to the uh, uh, ones that everybody got just by virtue of being in the service or being over there, I got the uh, Army Commendation Medal. Can you tell me how you got that? Yes, yes, uh, and, uh, okay, well, let's take a break. Okay. All right, well, you're gonna edit this down so we can skip around a little bit. I'll, uh. No, I'm not gonna uh, edit it, but well, you, can, well, but you can skip around anyway. Oh, okay, okay. Well, to, to give you. Tell me about how you got your Army Commendation Medal. Okay. Uh, to, to go there, we have to get all what, what led up to it. And I had, uh, I, was, I was there over in, over in Vietnam, say, with, with an infantry outfit. And we, you know, just going out on all these, uh, well, well, they were search and destroy operations. They were exploratory things. You never knew what you were going to find. And I thought, Oh, gee, yeah, this is fun. Uh, 
be nicer to be a lab technician. Well, I went over, one of the times we were back in base camp, I went over to the orderly room, you know, which every, every, every place has an orderly room, even if it's a tent city in the middle of nowhere. And the fellow who was the uh, secretary, private first class, his name was S-Z-O-M-B-A-T-Y, pronounced somebody. And of all, the, of all the jobs for this kid to get, to be the orderly room clerk who answered the phone, he had more fun picking up that telephone and, say, and saying, uh, headquarters company, uh, PFC somebody speaking, sir, can I help you? And then he would you know, invariably say, this is somebody, sir, can I help you? This is somebody, sir. And of course, yeah, no, I thought, oh gosh, that's just great. Uh, I talked to him and I said, you know, what's chance of getting, that, getting transferred to, you know, to like uh, some place as, as a lab tech? He said, yeah, like, you know, one in a zillion, but go ahead, put in an application for transfer. So I did. I'd been there probably three months. Well, just short of five months, we were somewhere south of, of uh, Saigon the whole outfit, and we run a joint operation with that uh, Air Cavalry. I went 100 and something, or okay, anyways. 95th, who knows, the Air Cav. They know who they are. They were based in Benoit. And they, we were, we'd go out in the field, big, again, went down there, set up a big base camp, and then went out in the field for varying periods of time. Well, the medics rotated out into the field, and I spent the first few days in the base camp, and then I was scheduled to go out the next morning. So I had dutifully packed everything that I would need, and about eight or nine o'clock that night, the first sergeant poked his, poked his head in our tent, and he said, uh, Dick, you're pack up, you're moving out in the morning. To which uh, I vividly remember saying, I'm all packed, cop. And he often called the first sergeant top. And he said, no, I mean pack everything. You're being transferred to division headquarters. you got to be kidding me, right? The request for transfer went through. Again, the leprechaun comes into play. The kid that took my place didn't fare too well. Yeah. Yeah. So I wind up uh, getting a helicopter ride back to division headquarters, and it turned out that that at division headquarters they had a 40-bed field hospital and a lab tech who was, I think, a draftee, and his two years were up in another week or two, and there was no replacement on the horizon. They needed a lab tech, and they went scrambling, looking through 201 files to see if anyone was trained as a lab tech, and you know, I just happened to luck of the draw. Hey, look at this. Yeah. And I was a temporary until someone was sent over from the States to take the job. Stayed there for the last uh, seven and a half months or so. Yeah. So I did five and a half, uh, I think the five months out in the field was around, yes, yeah, so around five and seven was the way it broke and broke down. Now, when I got there, this, this laboratory being a field hospital, he wasn't equipped to do that much. He could basically do urinalysis, uh, blood, uh, complete blood counts and, uh, and a smear. And uh, there was a, a lot of venereal disease over there, so they called GC smears, which is a test for gonococcus for gonorrhea. That was it. He had a microscope and a light bulb. Not a microscope light, but a light bulb. And, uh, he, didn't have an, he didn't have many slides, so he had to wash the slides over and over again for reuse. Right? Had a centrifuge, which was necessary to, to spin down the, the urine because you would examine the sediment see if there was anything innocuous in there. And well, this wasn't really, you know, I, I was trained to do a lot more than this, and, and I like, I, this is the kind of stuff I like to do. So I said, gee, I gotta do something about this. And I thought, well, Saigon, they gotta have a lot of stuff. So uh, after I was there a couple weeks, I went down, I, and I asked this guy, can't you? He says, oh, I've requisitioned everything and never get anything. And I, well. One of the first things I did was make up this incredibly long list. I ordered every piece of lab equipment and you know, the Army listed anywhere. Right? And, and all the reagents and everything. Also, for these GC smears, you would stain the slide and you would first put on 
a blue stain called gentian violet, and then you would add an iodine solution to fix it. Right? Then you would wash it off with ethyl alcohol, and then you would add a red stain for the fourth stage, and that would, if there were any of these bacteria gram negative, they stain red. If they were, then they'd get stained, and then you'd dry the slide, wash it off with water, and then look at, let it dry, and look at it on the microscope. And if you saw these organisms with a red, two, uh, they call diplococcus, they, then you'd know, okay, that was significant for gonorrhea. Anyways, that uh, ethanol, well, that was supplied in five-gallon drums, and I simply had to squirt a little out of a squeeze bottle on the slide. Even though I did maybe 40 of these a day, it'd take a long time to use that much ethanol. Sort of two five-gallon drums. When that finally came in, you know the officers got one five-gallon drum. Ethanol was the 190 proof drinking alcohol. It's alcohol, comma, USP, comma, 190 proof, comma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So that was one of the, that, why did I get the Army Commendation Medal? Well, that wasn't the sole reason. But uh, I asked the kid there, I said, well, can't we get any stuff from Saigon? He said he tried. And I thought, well, maybe he didn't try hard enough. So I went down to Saigon. I went to the third field hospital. And some nice guys there. And I mean, they had boxes of slides. And they had real microscope lights. And they had all this equipment. And I, I was just drooling. And they were kind enough to give me some boxes of slides. And they also mentioned that they would love to have and this was 1966, the jungle fatigues and jungle boots, uh, they, which were different than the regular fatigues. Jungle fatigues uh, just were meant that the shirt was meant to be worn outside, had big pockets here and big pockets here, uh, and the jungle boots had a green webbing that uh, would let them breathe as opposed to the regular combat boots. Those were only issued to the guys in the field. The, Guys in Saigon did not get issued the jungle fatigues and jungle boots. So when you saw anybody in Saigon wearing jungle fatigues and jungle boots, he was a real soldier from out in the boondocks that happened to be in Saigon for a couple of days. Uh, you were hot stuff if you had jungle fatigues. And these guys that were working in a lab would have loved to have gone out in the town at night and wearing jungle fatigues and jungles. That was their prime want, not a problem. I went back, talked to the supply sergeant. I need jungle fatigues and jungle boots. He's got a warehouse full of them. Uh, a couple boxes of it. So I went back down to Saigon a, you know, a week later. Every Wednesday, I went down to Saigon, as it turned out. And with a couple boxes of jungle boots and all different sizes and boxes of jungle fatigues. And the pants were different, too. The pants had big pockets on the sides. And made a lot of friends, a lot of people happy, and started getting all the lab equipment I could get. I mean, I got pipettes, I got all kinds of beakers and flasks, and you name it. And now this helped because I could now, we had two doctors there at, the, at this 40 Bedfield Hospital. And they, by virtue of the fact that little could be done in the way of diagnostic laboratory workup, most of the people they saw, they either gave them aspirin, or they sent them to Saigon. You know, well, how can you tell what's wrong with them? And you need to do blood chemistries and you know, different things. So uh, I had to get away from this little <laughs> small number of tests that I could offer. Now, as I began to get equipment, I could offer more tests. And you know, let's see, well, what do I need for serology and bacteriology? and you know? well. The biggest thing I needed was a, it's what they call a spectrophotometer. It's a machine that reads uh, how much light is transmitted through a, through a solution in a, in a optically ground tube. And clear water will transmit 100%. And India ink will transmit 0%. And in between varying percentages of transmission. Now, if you set up uh, a solution that reacts with something, it turns red. Okay? And you can set it up to turn you know, the pale pink or the deep red and measure your transmission of light. You set up your knowns. Now if you do an unknown, you've got a, ch you've got a graph made and you can figure out, OK. So this is all the, the blood chemistry to figure out the amounts of the chemicals in, in the blood. Is it within a normal range? Well, I needed a spectrophotometer. And unfortunately, third field didn't have one. Uh, they would have given me one if they had an extra one. But those things were hard to get. 
There was another place called 17th Field Hospital. They had a pretty nice setup. They were in old French headquarters, uh, and the laboratory was really nice. It was a stucco building. You went in, and they had the office, then a room for hematology, and a room for urinalysis, a room for bacteriology, a room for serology. No. Really cool. But they were actually rather snotty. They didn't want to give me anything, and they didn't need anything. Said, well, gee, thanks a lot. But blood chemistry was in its own room. And I saw the spectrophotometer I wanted. And I also knew that on Sunday, there was just one lab tech there. He ran the whole place. So I arranged to get down to Saigon on a Sunday with the ambulance special trip. And there were MPs in bunkers that behind the sandbags there guarding the place, of course. Yeah. But at any G, I could walk through. And the ambulance pulled up, and I went around to the back. And I pulled out a big cardboard box, inside which was a styrofoam container. And this box was clearly labeled, Human Blood Rush. All right. And I picked it up. Now, it was empty. But I picked it up and struggled and carried this empty container into the hospital, uh, into the lab room. Went right down. Now, the only thing that was going to go wrong with this plan is if the guy happened to be in blood chemistry room at that time. Nope, opened the door, nobody there went in. Boom, started ripping out wires, put this thing in the blood box, put it back on my shoulder. Now I go sailing past the MPs. The damn thing weighs 40 pounds, only now I'm walking well, by like it's empty. But of course, I'm young and strong, so it doesn't matter. Throw that in the back of the ambulance, and away we go. I get back up to Xeon. We're rolling. Now I can do blood chemistries. It apparently, CID, which is the Criminal Investigation Division of, of the Army, was all over Saigon trying to find out who stole that spectrophotometer. And the guys at Third Field Hospital were laughing because they knew who stole the spectrophotometer. A lot of that went on in Vietnam, and you weren't stealing. You were simply taking something the Army owned and moving it to another place, and it was being used. It would have been one thing, I mean, it would have been wrong to take something and sell it to the civilians. But, to, you know, by the way, 17th Field got another one the next day from a warehouse in Saigon. Yeah, but I never could have gotten it. Yeah. Well, I'd been going on little by little over the first couple of months offering the doctors, hey, we can do this now, we can do that now, as I was getting some equipment. Now I could do a whole bunch of tests. And I also, okay. Next thing we did was go down to the uh, airport, Tonsonu Airport, and where the planes unloaded and with some phony lading bill or something, the sergeant went and got some refrigerator, refrigerator freezers. And so I got one and the officers got one, the sergeants got one. But now, now I had a freezer where I could store stuff. So I was rolling. I, and all the, all the uh, chemicals and, and reagents that I needed, those I could get at, at the third field, but I couldn't get the, the doodad that I needed. So, so now I'm going, going strong. And now the doctors who it said we're basically relegated to passing out aspirin or putting the guys in an ambulance. Now they can send them back to the lab to have some blood drawn, wait for the lab work, and make a diagnosis and play doctor. And they were tickled pink. Mm -hmm. And it was a complete surprise to me at about, uh, you know, after about six months, uh, a couple months before I left or so, the, uh, the captain said, uh, you know, put me in for an Army Commendation Medal, for, which is a, uh, you know, a non combat type of thing, and meritorious service as opposed to valor in, in combat or something. So, But uh, and it was nice. It was ni the nicest thing was that there was an actual ceremony in, in my, uh, and they took a picture and, and I, so my, my parents had a picture of a full bird colonel pinning a medal on me. So that, where was the ceremony? Right there at, at, at Zion, yeah. Yeah, I mean most of the medals given out were Purple hearts and bronze stars and silver stars. And, you know, at the end of the line was a little me getting this uh, worthless Army Commendation Medal. You know, but uh, the other guys really did something there and there. So, you know, mine was just a gift. But, uh, what was the food like while you were in Vietnam? The food was was good. Sea rations were okay. I never remind. I never remembered. Uh, not liking the sea rations. There were some meals you liked better than others, and you could always swap with somebody. Just like you could always swap 
Me, I smoke camels, so I could always swap the Pall Malls or the Marlboros for camels. Do they still give cigarettes with the, the uh, ready-to-eat meals? Today? I don't know. It's a shame if they don't. There's a bit of our heritage gone. But they don't have rickshaws in Hong Kong anymore either. So, uh, Did you have all the supplies that, and resources that you wanted and needed over there? Well, we see you didn't have the medical resources. Well, that l didn't have the laboratory equipment. But remember, this was a 40-bed field hospital. The, lab the hospitals in Saigon had everything they needed. You know, and we were able to transport the guys down to Saigon. So, you know, could we have gotten along without it? Certainly. You know, would, was it much better for me and, and for the uh, people there to have it? Yeah, yeah it was a luxury, but uh, a luxury that we couldn't live without. As an Oscar Wilde said, you know, I can do without the necessities so long as I can have the luxuries. Yeah. What would be a typical day like when you were back in the field um, at the, in your first five months? Or the, uh, well, there were, there were two, two kinds of typical days. If you were in base camp, uh, this, this being your, you know, the base of operations that was uh, defended with a perimeter and uh, mines laid at different places outside the perimeter to prevent anyone from infiltrating at night and, and guards, et cetera, and sandbagged entrances and the uh, tents somewhat fortified with sandbags around the base, et cetera. Uh, in this tent city, there were uh, some chores that needed to be done during, uh, during the day for guys that were spending the time back in the base camp for the whole day. Uh, for me, it, uh, I pretty much uh, could do whatever I wanted. I could go into town. There was a little town there, get a haircut, yeah. you get Coca-Cola on the side of the road. Uh, uh, so, but there w was there a lot to do? Uh, no, I mean, you, we played chess or cards or something, and you were basically waiting to go back out in the field uh, to give uh, future fans a interesting glimpse of what life was like there. And I've always thought that I would see this scene in a movie, but I never have, and it's a shame because it needs to be an aerial shot. When you, the mu it's six months, it's hot and dry, and six months, it's hot and wet in Vietnam. And they have monsoon climate. Now, when the rains come in, after it hasn't rained for six months and everything is just dry and dusty, and then the rains come along, at the beginning of the rainy season, it'll rain every day. At the height of the rainy season, it will rain three or four times a day. And when I say rain, anyone would kill for water pressure in their shower like this rain. Right. Yes, it is a torrential rain. Okay. And what happens is this. The sky is absolutely clear and blue. Five minutes at five of 12, let's say. And it advances slowly throughout the rainy season. But the, it, the times, you know, just you go from once to now is twice a day, there's three times a day. And the times are 10 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon, and 5.30 in the afternoon. And, of course, it'll be 10.15 is gradually. The sky's bright and clear, clear blue, not a cloud at 5 or 12. At 12 o'clock, it is completely overcast, nothing but gray. At 12.05, it starts to rain. And it rains like you've never seen. At 12.13, the rain stops. The sky is completely gray. At 12.18, the clouds part, and it's nothing but blue. And three minutes later, you can't see a cloud. Nothing but blue. It's just an incredible phenomenon that takes place. Now, because this occurs at virtually the same times every day for a certain period, and there was a time when the rain would be due be shortly after 5 o'clock. Probably a three-week period there where it went from like 5 to 6.15. Okay. Now, we did have showers, which was a 50-gallon drum set up and, and a shower head, and you could pull on a cord, and the gravity would, would shower you off. Okay. But it, when it started, when the, one of the rains was due after 5 o'clock, which was the end of the work day in base camp, this picture was, this was the picture. Okay. 
if you looked, you would see heads peeking out of all the tent flaps. Right? And some of them might have an arm extended holding a bar of soap or a, or a towel. Right? And all these heads looking up at the sky. When it started to rain, 1,500 naked GIs with a bar of soap in their hand would run out and furiously lather because you, you, had to, you had to get washed off. You couldn't, if, when the rain stopped, it stopped. You didn't want to be all soaked up. And then ran back inside to dry off. And I've always thought that should be an aerial shot from, from a helicopter in terms of what it was really like there. It was, and that was the best shower you got. It dribbled out of the 55-gallon drum. You know, you didn't, just, just the gravity. But, ah, oh, you really got clean when it, during the monsoon rains. So that was, uh, that was something that you'll never forget. Now, in the field, now, oh, in, in, in terms of food, back in the base camp, you actually had a mess hall set up where they had cooking apparatus, and virtually everything was in cans. Interestingly enough, they'd open a large cans that had whole eggs in them. So fried eggs came out of a can. And I guess if you vacuum, you vacuum out the air and they're vacuumed back, then they're going to keep forever. And of course, everything the Army had to keep forever. Yeah. Right. I'm convinced that we had a heart attack from the Revolutionary War slipped into a meal somewhere. But uh, so the, the food in, in base camp was certainly uh, uh, acceptable, uh, and you could supplement it with uh, some things you could buy it at a commissary if you could get near one PX type of store. Yeah, but uh, there was nothing wrong with the food, and of course, plenty of it. All you all you could have. Uh, out in the field, it was two things. It was either the sea rations or a hot meal. They tried to get you a hot meal every day. It's when you were going to settle somewhere for the evening. Now, this was for the main units. I mean, our reconnaissance outfits, we didn't, the recon patrols, we, we, nobody was going to come and bring food to 10 guys. But a couple of times, when I was on a big operation, and one of them was Easter. Right? And they made a big deal out of getting a hot Easter meal out to the troops in the field. And we, you know, we hadn't, we didn't have water to brush our teeth, right? but uh, they made sure to get us a, a hot meal for Easter Sunday. So there were things that, yeah. when they complain now about the food, I go, give me a break. I know they take care of them, food. The Army does travel on its stomach. Yeah, that's, that's one thing. Where they, they, I don't think they ever slack on, on the food. The sea rations, as they were quite good, and also, interestingly enough, again, for, for people that want to study this, there was always a fellow uh, who had demolition material, that being a large block of C4, which is a plastic putty-like stuff. And it's harmless by itself. You drop it, nothing's going to happen. But if you, and you can mold it to fit it somewhere, and when you stick a wire in it, I guess, and send an electrical charge into it, it goes bang. Well. This stuff burns for a long time and at a very hot temperature. So he was always getting pestered by everybody else for a little chunk of this C4, which you hoarded and guarded and treasured, because you just took a little fingernail-sized piece of that, put it down, lit it with a match, take a second to get it going. But when it got going, it would burn with a blue flame, really hot. And you just hold your can of C ration, open it up, and hold it by the, yeah. You had a little item that you told them. Hold it by the lid. Just hold that can over there, over that flame. And you'd heat a can in no time at all. So a little chunk of C4 was a handy item to have. Yeah. And, uh, <coughs> now, water wasn't always uh, as plentiful as, as could be. We would always get supplied, and you could carry two, three, four canteens. But, you know, and, uh, you know, a gallon of water uh, weighs eight pounds. You know, a pint's a pound. So if you've got a quart canteen, you know, four canteens, you're like, lugging an extra eight pounds. And you're going to walk 15 miles that day through the jungle or through that junk I described. Uh, two canteens is plenty. But when this, you're, you're out after a while. And at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to get resupplied with water. Uh, what that operation we were on where we were following the tanks and half-tracks and 
tramping our way through this vegetation, which sprang back up, was pretty exhausting, at, uh, more tiring than usual. And by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, everyone was out of water. But the guys in the tanks had some five-gallon cans. Now, they were pouring water out into the canteen cups for the guys falling behind. By 3 o'clock in the afternoon, all the tanks and half-tracks were out of water. Uh, well, we'll live. Well, we stopped for a little rest. You couldn't just keep this up all day. And the half-track that I was following found a five-gallon can. You know, how many places are there to hide something inside a half-track? I don't know. But uh, apparently it uh, was tucked in a corner, and they opened it up, and it was sort of rusty, uh, this can. And they opened up and poured, and the water, when just the can was very rusty, and the water was brown. Yeah. And I held out my canteen cup, and they poured this brown water in it, and I thought, great, extra iron. And I took a second cup, and that is the best drink I ever had in my whole life. You bet. And you didn't get sick. It was just iron. That's all, it was just rust. Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't have to take my vitamins that day. Yeah. Yep. We might have added an iodine tablet to it and waited a couple minutes, but, ah. Oh. Yep. It was a, probably about 85 to 90 degrees and uh, the water itself and and muddy, and that's, I, that's I will always go down in history as the best drink I ever had. You bet. So, uh, it's funny, we get spoiled sometimes, and uh, with the everyday conveniences. As a medic, what, when you were in the field and not in the base camp, what were your duties like? What were the kind of things that you had? <coughs> well, because I'd had the extensive training. Say, so basically, they, they teach the, the average medic to keep someone alive for a short period of time until they can get, get them evacuated. You know, uh, put a pressure dressing on, stop the bleeding, clear the airway, uh, the, the basics. Okay. So Whereas the usual things that you have to deal with? Your emergency life-saving procedures. And, the, and if, you know, if someone is uh, wounded from a, a bullet or shrapnel, uh, et cetera, then, you know, you, you want to do all you can to uh, keep them, keep them going. You know, all, all medics know how to start an IV, that sort of thing. But we were trained, uh, in addition to that, for a lot of little extra procedures. Uh, thoracentesis is what they call draining fluid out of the lungs. And of course, if you get shot in the chest, that's one of the problems. You can drown from blood flowing into the lungs, and you can't breathe. But uh, you, you don't have to be a surgeon to do thoracentesis, as we found out. And you go in the back and, -da -da, and set a drain. Uh, again, with clearing an airway, with uh, what, they, what they call a uh, tracheotomy, which is what you see done in the hospital, where they've got a metal tube there and a little cannula and all that. Well, you, you can do. I, Cricothyroidotomy is what they call it. You count down five rings, there's little rings there in the throat, and anything. You, what you want to do is open the airway. You, know, you can't get air through the mouth down the throat, then you want to go in the windpipe, in the trachea. And just open that up, and the air will get pulled in automatically. Right. Anything. A pen knife. You know. If you had something stuck in your throat, and, and I had a nail clipper handy, I could save your life. Right. And you'd much rather have a scar then be dead. <laughs> Give them the choice. Yes. So little, little things like that. that but, but it took practice and it, and it took training. We did a lot of suturing. You know, that, uh, I, I felt like I got him thousands of uh, sutures with uh, throwing guys up and that. Uh, we, and uh, we, I carried uh, a pretty good supply of, uh, of medicine. Uh, I had a wide range of drugs because I learned a lot of pharmacology, and that's worth commenting on also, because I was there from February 1966 to February 1967. <coughs> I think when I got there, there were close to 100,000 guys, and when I left, there were 
over 300, 350,000. So that year saw a big buildup. Now, also at that point in time in America, there, this was a little before the, you know, certainly well before the height, but a little before the beginning of the hippie drug craze that swept the country. And I had in my, in my aid kit, you were supposed to carry five morphine syrettes, and the morphine is all compact. It's a little toothpaste tube with a needle and a protective cover. And if you have to give morphine, you pop the needle in and sort of roll up the tube. And it's uh, apparently, I don't try to, but quite the stuff. I mean, someone could be in agony and hit them with the morphine, roll the tube up, and they'll smile. So it completely it's no, you know, takes away all the, all the pain, stop this, and is blocked from going to the brain. At any rate, uh, I carried uh, 40 or 50 morphine syrettes. No one ever asked me for one. Uh, the, and when I, when I went to refill, uh, when I was back in base camp, I went into the medic's tent where the doctor was, and the safe containing the narcotics was open. And I just went in and took whatever I wanted. And, uh, there was no, no one asked me what I was taking. No one looked at what I was taking. There, there wasn't any drug use when I was there. When guys went out on patrol and got to go out and guard the perimeter all night, uh, yes, I'd give them an amphetamine so they could stay awake. Uh, no one ever asked me for another one. I said, hey, those are good. Can I get some more of those? No, it was something that kept them awake all night. They didn't fall asleep. And the, what came to be known as speed freaks that got hooked on amphetamines and couldn't get enough of them, I say there wasn't any of that. Uh, I did see, you'll see a, lo a lot in the movies and in documentaries about all these guys laying around smoking grass, stoned out of their mind, and that's how they got through the war. And that may very well have been the case later, but it wasn't the case when I was there. And a couple months after I was there, Nikki Leone, bless his soul, from, from Brooklyn, and I hope Nikki's still with us, uh, came back from town. He had an envelope and he bought some grass. And I'd never seen it or tried it, but uh, why not? Emptied some tobacco out of a camel and took a couple of hits. This very harsh stuff, as I recall. And, you know, your head spun. Well, Nikki wound up getting, getting sent to Japan. He had hepatitis. And no one ever came up with any grass again. Nikki came back six months later and went back into town and got some more grass. But Nikki was from Brooklyn. Maybe you saw it in the streets of Brooklyn. Right. Uh, so, so they there wasn't any, any problem with drugs. And that was out in the field. Now, when I went back to the hospital, the little field hospital, they had a pharmacy there. And that pharmacy was, just had every drug imaginable. Uh, and all the things that, you know, I don't know if they, if they had uh, this uh, Oxycontin then, I, probably not, but uh, what's been in the news and all that that people were abusing. And there were plenty of potent painkillers sitting on the shelf, you know, codeine, as well as uh, there probably was a safe for, uh, I, I certainly didn't have any use for morphine when I was a lab tech, but all these barbiturates, amphetamines, and uh, different painkillers were on the shelf in the pharmacy, and n nobody wanted to, you could get in, the, the pharmacy had a Dutch door, right, and the bottom locked with a, with a key, and the top locked with a hook inside. If you wanted to get in the pharmacy after hours, hit the top door, it would bounce it, and the hook would pop out of the top, and you push it open, reach inside, and open the door, in case you needed anything. Nobody ever took any drugs out of the pharmacy. You know, go in there and get some aspirin. Huh? Or somebody at Tigan, if a guy had an upset stomach, you know, these, this sort of thing. You know, contact, uh, the super contact was called Ornade, and that was a prescription-only drug. So, you know, things like that you go get, but there was, there was no, uh, no drug use or abuse um, then uh, uh, that anyone would ever have noticed. You know, was there a drug addict in the service? Of course. Right. How many people knew him? Probably very few. Yeah. Did you make any close friendships while you were in the service? I, I did and didn't keep in touch that, that much afterward. When I was in the service, when you're there in an outfit, of course, your buddies and comrades. Uh, and then leaving and going to Vietnam, 
Uh, I got tight with everybody there, but then you all of a sudden you're gone and everybody else is left there. Yeah. And, I, and of course, I, when I left, I had applied to uh, college from Vietnam and I was accepted to, to Temple University in Philadelphia. So when I got back, I had, in February, I had a few months, I was gonna start in the fall. So I had to find a job, and which I did at Institute of Living in Hartford as a, as a lab tech. And then I knew I, I was going to Temple, so my future was sort of going to be busy and planned, and you know, some of these guys had another year and a half left in the service or something. Uh, I wasn't, didn't, didn't see, didn't see that many of them. Uh, I didn't I recall some guys from the local area who might have called each other over the next couple of years, but. Do uh, you uh, recall your last day in service? My last day? Oh, vividly. Now, uh, because my last day, I went down to Saigon, got on the plane, and it was an 18 hour flight right, back to Fort Dix. Right. Uh, Again, having been a medic and having learned all this pharmacology, I knew that the sleeping pills of that era were the barbiturates. Yeah. Uh, I had never had a problem sleeping. In fact, I'm the guy that they had to wake up and say, yo, incoming, there's mortar shells landing all around, I'm sleeping like a baby. Right. So I head for a foxhole. But, uh, and that's true, no exaggeration. I could sight sleep through the mortar attacks if somebody didn't wake me up. But 18 hours on a plane, I thought to myself, you know what? And I took a phenobarbital, whatever strength it was, uh, when I got on the plane. Yeah, and I slept like a baby for 18 hours. That's one heck of a pill, let me tell you. Uh, the plane landed in, uh, landed in Hawaii. L stopped in Guam, stopped in Hawaii. And I woke up, I got off the plane, very sluggish. And uh, I remember Guam because they still use half dollars. They actually had went in, got something to eat, and at the register to pay, they had slots in the register for dime, nickel, quarter, half dollar. Benny's joke, of course. I thought, wow, look at that. I took all the half dollars they had. I thought they were cool. I hadn't seen a half dollar in ages. Uh, then we stopped in Hawaii, where I tried to call my cousin, who was going to the University of Hawaii, but turned out he'd graduated in the year I was overseas and was now in the state of Washington, at University of Washington, so I missed him. But, uh, and then it was from uh, Hawaii to, uh, to Fort Dix. But uh, all the time I was in the air, I was sleeping like a baby. Then got back to Fort Dix, and you were then discharged. Went through a couple hours worth of paperwork, but we were in a hurry, and everybody knew it, and they were in a hurry. There, there wasn't, uh, I think there were a lot of guys who had just spent a, much rougher year over there than I had. As I, it was a piece of cake for me for the last few months. And some guys may have spent a whole year in the field. And they really didn't want to hear what some kid whose job was to collect their uniforms and stack them on a shelf. They really didn't want to take any guff from him. And the kid whose job it was to collect the uniforms and stack them on the shelf was well aware of that. But things went pretty quickly. You know, you sign this, sign this, and boom, and gave you your money, and got, got a ride to the bus station or whatever, and you were gone. And that was it. So it was, it took, it took a few hours, but, uh, and depending on what time you got in, you might have had to stay overnight. And there were barracks. As I recall, uh, I might have gotten in there at night and out of there in the morning, but it was, you know, within eight or ten hours, I was from landing on the plane to being at the bus station. What did you do as a career after the war? I went to uh, Temple University. Uh, I majored in mathematics there. And with my mathematics uh, training, I then drove a truck and a taxi cab and delivered pizzas until I decided to go to California. Went to California and married. My son came along in 74. I'd gotten a job at Kaiser Hospital in Los Angeles as a lab tech. And I figured I'll go back to college, Cal State, get a degree in microbiology. And I was a couple, about a semester and a half, two semesters away, they're in the quarter system actually. So from, from finishing that, and I had started a little mail order business on the side, and the mail order business just mushroomed, and I wound up spending the next 20 years in the 
music industry with mail order and a retail store and design and production and you name it. So, so I just lucked into that. But, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add that we've not covered in this interview? In the Vietnam experience, yeah, a couple, couple things worth telling. I, when I got to the field hospital, uh, there were a few guys that actually, you know, were ill and didn't have to get sent to Saigon, but couldn't go back on duty. So out of the 40 beds, 12 or 15 were, were always occupied. Uh, I'm glad they were unoccupied ones because that's where I slept. I always slept in the hospital. I never got, I had a, I had a space in a, in a barracks, but I just immediately figured out, <laughs> bring the changes, the clothes down, put them in the lab, you can, the showers outside anyway, et cetera. So, uh, but I noticed that the guys had nothing to do. You know, I, you know unless except you read a magazine, uh, and not everybody's a reader. I am, but uh, not everyone. So I sent a letter back to my folks, and I said, "Hey, do me a favor, go up in the attic." And some of those games I had as a kid, you know, Scrabble, Monopoly, whatever. Why don't you box them up and send them to me? So the guys here got something to do, and get some get some crossword puzzle books and stuff like that, and magazines. Send them along with it. At that time, the Hartford Times existed, and they published a daily letter from Vietnam. Uh, they had a column, letters from Vietnam. My folks sent that article into the Times, and uh, sent my letter to the Times, and they published it. And here's Sam Deaker, and, you know, hey, he's looking for games and uh, puzzles and stuff for his, uh, for his hospital. Anybody out there? Well, I don't know this is happening. Yeah. And one day, uh, I get, and before my parents send me the clipping from the newspaper telling me that this has happened, a couple of packages come for me, addressed to me, you know, and I get games inside them. And then the next day, and the one that always touched me the most, I got like 40 big cards, a third grade class had, you know, all made cards and sent them to us. And I thought, wow, man, that's really cool. Uh, I, by the way, I work with kids now, uh, first graders helping them read. So have always been a special thing to me. Uh, and then the next day, you know, it's like six or seven packages. Well, that was this was before the deluge. It it wound for for a month for for a, a good okay for a good two months, probably averaged forty packages a day. And I don't mean a I don't mean a monopoly game. I mean packages. I mean Milton Bradley sent boxes. Bill Sabat and I sent tons of stuff. Uh, different, uh, different commercial outfits, and you know, probably got stuff from Travelers and Connecticut General, you name it, as well as tons of individuals. Right? And to the to the first one of the first couple ones, I thought I didn't know. I thought, oh, this is nice. My parents must have asked some friend of theirs, so I wrote a letter. And then I wrote a second letter, and then, then you know, here they come. I went, you got to be kidding me. I can't write all these people letters. I mean, I do with enough hours in the day. But one of the letters I wrote, my parents sent it to the Times, and they published a thank you. So it's good. That thanked everybody. The interesting thing about this was, well, for a 40-bed field hospital, obviously, you know, <laughs> there wasn't room. Uh, so now the ambulance went down to Saigon. The ambulance went every day, and I would just go on Wednesdays. But now every day the ambulance went, it took boxes, and they got distributed down in Saigon. And when I was ready to leave, and this, this was a full five months after, you know, maybe four months, might have been, didn't take me long after I wrote my parents the note. And then I kept, so it's probably four and a half months worth of packages. Did it slow down, as things will, without constant reminders, but they were still coming. I was still getting 10 or 15 packages a week. Now I'm ready to leave. And you would think it would be a simple matter to just go over to the guy at the post office, hey, look, I'm leaving. Now, uh, you know, if I get any letters, you can forward them to me. But boxes, that's going to be the games and stuff. So just open them. Simple enough to you or me. And this is before computers. That was the most complicated thing. It was addressed to me. They had to deliver it to me. They were going to ship that stuff back to me. And I, 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 had a, I wound up with a full bird kernel ri writing an actual order that enabled the post office to open, and with me signing permissions, to open any packages. Yeah. 
So it's quite an ordeal, but thankfully that was done. Otherwise, I would have, been, would have wound up giving them to people on <laughs> people from Hartford that mailed them. I would have been <laughs> God. Yes, but lo logic finally prevailed. Yes. So. I'm going to have to vacate there, so Okay. I would like to thank you so much for participating in this class with Sam. That's great. I hope that some of what I related is a little different than the usual, and uh, people will say, oh, that was interesting someday.